Suppose you're traveling to work and you see a stop sign. What do you do? Well, that depends on how you exegete the stop sign. A postmodernist deconstructs the sign, that is, knocks it over with his car, ending forever the tyranny of the north-south traffic over the east-west traffic. Similarly, a Marxist refuses to stop because he sees the stop sign as an instrument of class conflict. He concludes that the Boer's Way use the north-south road and obstruct the progress of the workers in the east-west road. A serious and educated Catholic rolls through the intersection because he believes he cannot understand the stop sign apart from its interpretive community and tradition. Observing that the interpretive community doesn't take it too seriously, he doesn't feel obligated to take it too seriously either. An average Catholic or Orthodox or Coptic or Anglican or Methodist or Presbyterian or whatever doesn't bother to read the sign but he'll stop if the car in front of him stops also. A fundamentalist taking the text very literally stops at the stop sign and waits for it to tell him to go. <laughs> A seminary educated evangelical preacher might look up stop in his lexicons of English and discover that it can mean one, something which prevents motion, such as a plug for a drain or a block of wood that prevents a door from closing. Two, a location where a train or bus lets off passengers. The main point of his sermon the following Sunday on this text is, when you see a stop sign, it is a place where traffic is naturally clogged, so it is a good place to let off passengers from your car. An Orthodox Jew does one of two things. A, take another route to work that doesn't have a stop sign so that he doesn't run the risk of disobeying the law, or B, stop at the sign and say, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us thy command to stop. Wait three seconds, according to his watch, and then proceed. Incidentally, the Talmud has the following comments on this passage. Rabbi Meyer says, he who does not stop shall not live long. Rabbi Hillel says, cursed is he who does not count to three before proceeding. Uh, Rabbi Simon ben Judah says, why three? Because the Holy One, blessed be he, gave us the law, the prophets, and the writings. Rabbi ben Isaac says, because of the three patriarchs. Rabbi Yehuda says, why bless the Lord at a stop sign? Because it says, be still and know that I am God. <laughs> a scholar from the Jesus Seminar concludes that the passage stop undoubtedly was never uttered by Jesus himself because being the progressive Jew that he was, he would never have wanted to stifle people's progress. Therefore, stop must be a textual insertion belonging entirely to stage three of the gospel tradition when the church was first confronted by traffic in its parking lot. A New Testament scholar notices there is no stop sign on Mark Street, but there is one on Matthew and Luke Streets, and concludes that the ones on Luke and Matthew Streets are both copied from a sign on a street no one has ever seen called Q Street. There is an excellent 300-page doctoral dissertation on the origin of these stop signs and the differences between stop signs on Matthew and Luke Street in the scholar's commentary on the passage. There is an unfortunate omission in the dissertation, however, it doesn't explain the meaning of the text. An Old Testament scholar points out that there are a number of stylistic differences between the first and second half of the passage stop. For example, ST contains no enclosed areas and five line endings, whereas OP contains two enclosed areas and only one line termination. He concludes that the author for the second part is different from the author of the first part and probably lived hundreds of years later. <laughs> later scholars determine that the second half is itself actually written by two separate authors because of similar stylistic differences between the O and the P. 
Another prominent Old Testament scholar notes in his commentary that the stop sign would fit better into the context three streets back. Unfortunately, he neglected to explain why in his commentary. Clearly, it was moved to its present location by a later redactor. He thus exegetes the intersection as though the sign were not there. Because of the difficulties in interpretation, another Old Testament scholar amends the text, changing the T to H. Shop is much easier to understand in context than stop because of the multiplicity of the stores in the area. The textual corruption <laughs> probably occurred because shop is so similar to stop on the street signs several streets back that it is a natural mistake for a scribe to make. Thus, the sign should be interpreted to announce the existence of a shopping area. If this is true, it could indicate that both meanings are valid, thus making the thrust of the message stop and shop. But a prophetic preacher notices that the square root of the sum of the numeric representations of the letters S-T-O-P, Sigma, Tau, Omicron, Pi in the Greek alphabet, multiplied by 40, the number of testing, and divided by 4, the number of the world, north, south, east, and west, equals 666. Therefore, he concludes that stop signs are the dreaded mark of the beast, a harbinger of divine judgment upon the world, and must be avoided at all costs. Okay. I got that off the internet. <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful thing the internet is. And uh, at 9.15 in the morning, we need something to kind of make us laugh and, and enjoy the fact that uh, most hermeneutics is humanutics. Uh, really. The, um, a man came up to me at Kansas City a couple of weeks ago at our exhibit at the North American Christian Convention and shared this gem with me. He said, if you have already learned all that you are going to learn, then you are all you are ever going to be. And I think that's kind of why we're here today, because we all believe that we should grow as Christians in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I appreciate the selected theme of this renewal conference, confidence and assurance. The believer lives in a world of uncertainty and fear, heightened and fueled at 5.30 each evening when the talking heads of ABC Worried News Tonight, the CBS Evening Woes, and NBC Frightly News inject their miserable postmodern views into the veins of John Q. Citizen. Happens every night. From the front page of USA Today, flexible ethics. It depends. Nearly two in three adults believe ethics vary by situation or that there is no unchanging ethical standard of right and wrong. That is the postmodern world that you and I live in. But we are not John Q. citizen. Our citizenship, the Bible says in Philippians 3 and verse 20, is in heaven, Amen. not on planet Earth. So we don't think or believe or act or behave like those living in a Jurassic Park, the lost world. Solomon said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And as believers in Christ, we have set our mind on things above, not on things of the earth, Amen. because we have died to self and to sin and have been buried and raised with Christ, according to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And so therefore we think and act with confidence and assurance. Amen. I stand before you this morning as a fortunate man. To paraphrase, more correctly, to personalize what Paul told young Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 13 through 15. Evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for me, I will continue in what I have learned and become convinced of because I know those from whom I learned it, how from childhood I have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make me wise for salvation 
through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm a fortunate man because I had godly parents who raised me that way, and if you did, you are a fortunate person as well. Amen. So I have confidence today because I know that God loved me and created me in his image, and even though that image was marred by sin, God loved me enough to send his only begotten son to atone for my sins on the cross. And today I know that because of that, I have pardon, I have peace, I have provision. I know who I am, but more than that, and better than that, I know whose I am. Amen. I know why I am here and where I am going. Amen. I believe that Christ dwells in my heart by faith and that as long as I abide in the vine, he will abide with me. Amen. And I know above all that he will never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. Now you can have that same confidence too. I have a multicolored poster in my office which I thought about bringing today and having some young men hold it up here to see it. It's a, really a work of art. It's a beautiful thing. But the best thing about it is the message. It says at the top, as believers, you are saved forever by grace through faith. You are forgiven, accepted, beloved of God, servants of the Most High God, new creatures, dead to sin, alive to God, walking in the newness of life, baptized into Christ Jesus, clothed with Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, holy, blameless, at peace with God, Christians, born again, partakers of the divine nature, empowered by God, children of promise, one in him, the body of Christ, seated in heaven, kingdom citizens, a royal priesthood, vessels of honor, salt of the earth, light of the world, soldiers of Christ, fishers of men, ministers of reconciliation, victorious. That's what you are if you're a Christian. Amen. Our text says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Amen. Now I see three tremendous truths in this text. Power, passage, and proof. First of all, let's examine the power. The verse begins, we know. Our power source, our power supply, is knowledge. Knowledge is power. Paul said he could do everything through Christ who gave him strength, Philippians 4.13. How? It was because Paul had a burning desire within himself to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, Philippians 3 and verse 10. So knowledge is power. But not mere knowledge of science or Sagan or self. Amen. It is not special knowledge or super knowledge of hidden or mystical things. That was the mistake of people in the first century, the Gnostics, and that was the very reason this epistle was written. The word know or its equivalent is found 38 times in this small postcard of first John the writer wanted his readers to have confidence and assurance that's why J Vernon McGee calls this book the letter of certainties we know 38 times it opens with a positive statement of John's personal knowledge of Christ which I want to read beginning in verse 1 that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, that is, made flesh, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. When we personally know Christ, we have power to live triumphantly in Christ. 
Amen. Now there are seven important instances where the words we know or you know appear in 1 John. The first one is found twice, actually, chapter 2 and verse 29, chapter 5 and verse 18. We know that a righteous life indicates we have been born of God. In chapter 2, verse 29, he says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And again in chapter 5 and verse 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that for a fact, that a righteous life indicates that something has happened. We've been regenerated. We've been born anew, born again, born from above, born of God. Amen. The second thing we know in this book is found in chapter 3 and verse 2, and I'll probably be touching on some things that others might uh, speak on later in the conference. Chapter 3 and verse 2. We know that we shall be like Christ when he appears. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, when the apocalypse happens, when he is unveiled, when he is revealed, when he returns, when he comes again, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In my first ministry back in Lexington, Nebraska, back in the um, late 60s, Evelyn and I would take communion each Sunday night up a flight of stairs in a rather run-down part of town uh, to a dear old saint in Christ. And uh, she would sit on the edge of the bed and I would uh, uh, give her the emblems, bless the emblems, pray over them, talk with her. And before we left, she would invariably quote verbatim this verse, chapter 3 and verse 2, because that was her living hope. Someday she would be just like her Savior. She would see him as he is. She would say, I will see him as he is, not as they have painted him, not as they have described him, but I will see him as he is, and Amen. I will be like him. That's the confidence we need to have in our life, whether we're young or old. The third thing in First John that is an important instance where the words we know or you know appears is a few verses later in verse 5, chapter 3 and verse 5. We know that Christ came to take away our sins. Now, that subject in itself makes a good sermon. And my father used to preach one on all the biblical reasons why Jesus came to earth. But I think the main reason, the most important one as far as we are concerned, is found here in verse 5. You know, we know, that he was manifested, he was made flesh, he appeared to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. The sinless dying for the sinful. The sinless one dying for the sinners of the world. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. We can know that of all the reasons Jesus came to earth, the main reason was to take away our sins. To die for us on the cross in a death that was atoning and substitutionary and vicarious and salvation giving. The fourth thing we can know is found in chapter 3 and verse 14. And that's our text today. We know that we have passed from death to life. And I will just pass on to the next one because I want to come back and develop that one. Number five, we know that Christ lives in us by the witness of his spirit. Chapter 3 and verse 24 says, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us. How do we know that God dwells in us? By the Spirit whom he has given us. Amen. God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. And so to his obedient children, he imparts the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit, without which we could do nothing in life. Because he is our power source. He is our strength. He is our power. He is our wisdom. He is the one that gives us what it takes to live victoriously and triumphantly in life. And if the same spirit that entered the tomb of Jesus and brought back Jesus to life from the dead dwells in our bodies, then think of all the circumstances he can raise us from. Did you notice that when we sang that song, Brother King changed the words from just a few more weary days to just a few more happy days? Did you notice that subtle shift? In the book it says weary. In George's philosophy, it's happy. And that's the way it ought to be. Because 
just a few more happy days and then we'll be happy forever with him in heaven. The sixth thing that is mentioned in this book is found in chapter 5 and verse 13, a verse that I uh, uh, committed to memory some years ago, as many of you have. We know that we have eternal life. And I think one of the reasons this conference was designed was because, tragically, many people do not have that confidence and that hope and that assurance. I say, are you saved? And they say, well, I hope so. I think so. I really want to be. But 1 John 5, 13 says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And then a few verses later, number 7, we know that he hears whatever we ask of him. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. And when you get that kind of a confidence, your prayer life kind of begins to grow a little bit. When you have that assurance that whatever you ask according to his will, he has heard that petition that you have brought before his throne of grace. Now this book of First John is an excellent book for new Christians to read because of the repeated emphasis on knowing our status in Christ. When I was in located ministry for 25 years, I would encourage new Christians to read this little book through seven times before they read anything else in the Bible. And the reason I did that was because I had done some sales work and I knew that a person had to hear something seven times before it sinks in. And so I said, if you'll take this little postcard, and that's really what 1st, 2nd, 3rd John are, they're not big long epistles like Romans or Hebrews, they're postcards. I said, if you'll take this postcard and read it through seven times, it will sink in, it will dawn on you what has happened to you and your new status in Christ. And the reason I did that was because immediately after the baptism of Jesus Christ himself, Satan comes and tries to get him to doubt his identity. Because the first two temptations in Matthew 4 begin with what words? If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. And even when he was on the cross, that's what they were saying. If you are the Christ, then come down from the cross. And so that's Satan's strategy to get the believer to doubt his identity in Christ. And the only way we can answer him is the way Jesus did. He knew the word. And he quoted the word to the devil. In fact, someone has said, the next time the devil reminds you of your past, you just remind him of his future. Amen. Okay? Our past is taken care of in Christ. And Christ has taken care of his future. For sure. We read it in the book of Revelation. So if he did that with Jesus, what does he do with a new convert? If you are a child of God, if you are a Christian, if you are born again, you wouldn't have had that thought. You wouldn't have done that deed. You wouldn't have remembered that sin. And that's why it's so important to read this book and to know. It's comforting and encouraging to know that we've been born again, that we have eternal life, that Christ lives in us by the Spirit, that we have passed from death to life. So let the world wonder and let the world speculate, and if they want, let them doubt and mock. But as for us, we know. In fact, the Greek there means we know as a fact. And if we know, we believe. And if we believe, therefore, we will speak. We have that power to us. Now, the second thing is passage. We know that we have passed, made passage, crossed over a New English Bible from death to life. W. Vine says that past is in the perfect tense, indicating the permanent results of a past act. We could talk about, as an example, the Israelites at the Red Sea. Hebrews 11 and verse 29 says, By faith the people passed through, that is, crossed over, the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. What made the difference in the passage from one state to another? It was their faith in God. Amen. So believers by faith have passed from one state to another. Not just from Egypt to Canaan, but from death to life. From one kingdom to another. From Amen. one territory to another. John R. Stott calls this the great change. 
That's what it is. You can't talk about a greater change than passing from death to life. There is no greater contrast. This is the ultimate switch. And it's not physical death, obviously, that he's talking about here, but moral and spiritual death. The Bible says you were once dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Uh, Pulpit Helps carried this in their August issue. An open-air preacher was telling the old, old story when a thoughtless youth rapped out, you tell us about the burden of sin, but I feel none. And then he flippantly added, how much does sin weigh? 10 pounds? 20 pounds? 50 pounds? 100 pounds? And the preacher answered, tell me, son, if I put a 400-pound weight on the chest of a dead man, would he feel it? No, said the youth. Why not? Because he is dead. And the preacher said, and the man who feels no load of sin is dead spiritually. That's what the Bible says. We are dead in our sins, in our trespasses. Once we were. You were dead in your sins, but God made you alive with Christ. Colossians 2 and verse 13. And in chapter 1 and verse 13, he said, God rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us, I think the King James says, translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So the key here to this scripture is Jesus Christ. Love of the brethren, as important as it is, and as much as I believe in it and try to practice it and spread the word around the country and the world, is not the cause of our passage from death to life. Now, if you read that verse at first face value, that's kind of what it looks like, but it really isn't. It is the proof. It's the evidence. It's the mark. It's the sign. It's the badge, but it's not the cause. The cause is faith in Jesus Christ. That's how the Israelites passed through from one side to the other, and that's how we, by faith in Christ, pass from death to life. And the proof is that we love the brethren. Now, there is a companion text in the Bible I want you to look at, and that's John chapter 5 and verse 24. Written by the same author here. No two authors here that we're talking about, like in our hermeneutics uh, monologue at the beginning here. This is the same writer. It's the Apostle John, and he uses similar language, but here... He tells you the cause, whereas in our text, he's talking about the evidence. John 5, verse 24. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. Now notice, he has crossed over or he has passed from death to life. Faith in Christ is the cause and love for brothers is the effect. Amen. We have an excellent Bible school teacher in the church uh, that I attend on Sundays when I'm not on the road, and that's uh, Brother Herb Castile, retired judge from the bench, Christian author, good thinker. And we were going through the book of Ephesians a few months ago, and he pointed out that in Ephesians 1, verse 15, he said, this is really the essence of Christianity. Paul praised the Ephesians for two things. First, he says, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the other thing he mentions is your love for all the saints. Now you put John 5, 24 together with our text here in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, and you have the essence of Christianity. You have both the cause and the results of what it's all about. We believe in Jesus Christ. If we believe in Jesus Christ, what can we do but love all others who believe in Jesus Christ? Christ. That's what it's all about. This is the essence of Christianity. To believe in Christ and to have love for, notice what he says, all the saints. All the saints. And we don't know who they are all, so we just better love all of them. Because we don't have that knowledge of who's in and who's out. The Lord knows those who are his. And we have a pretty good idea because the fruit of the Spirit is manifest in love, joy, peace, and so on and so forth. And we can see that, so God calls us to be fruit inspectors, but not judges of our brethren. Now the passage. The passage is from death to life. 
Now, the, notice what the rest of the text says. I didn't read this here, and I should in 1 John 3, 14. After he says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren, he says, he who does not love his brother abides in death or he remains in death, as it says in the NIV. I didn't like being left behind. Uh, my parents went on a vacation once, and I used to get so car sick that they got sick of it, and they left me behind on purpose. Um, they told me about it ahead of time, but they went on a vacation while I, I stayed with some people that I didn't really like. <laughs> okay, I didn't like being left behind, and, and none of us, but this would be a horrible thing to be left behind to remain in a state of spiritual death and darkness. I don't want to dwell in darkness. I was scared to death of the dark when I was a kid. But that's what Paul says. You dwell, and John says, you dwell in darkness. I don't want to be dead while I live. Paul talks about the widows who were dead while they live. I don't want to be dead while I live. I don't want to reside in a bleak house of hatred. And those who hate are murderers. And John says, no murderer has eternal life in him. So thank God, I know I have crossed over from death to life because of my faith in Christ, which is the cause, and because I love my brothers, which is the proof or the evidence. Now let's talk about the proof. The third P here in our text is proof, because we love our brothers. Now there are three major sections on brotherly love in 1 John. John R. W. Stott says, John singeth his same refrain again and again. <laughs> and he does it three times. The first section on love is chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. And I just want to read them without comment. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you. Which thing is true in him and in you? Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The second refrain on love is in chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. Now, I read the text several times, verse 14. But as you've heard before, a text without a context is a pretext. And so I want to read the context here in which we find this. It begins, I believe, in verse 10 and goes through verse 18. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know because he by this we know love because he laid down his life for us, and we ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And then the third refrain of this familiar chorus that John keeps singing is in chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Amen. In this the love of God was manifest toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, 
we also ought to love one another. Amen. Now, when you study the context of those three refrains of love written by John, you will find seven stark contrasts. The first contrast is between darkness and light. The second contrast is between hatred and love. The third contrast is between Satan and God. And then the fourth contrast is between the children of the devil and the children of God. Archie Word used to say, if you marry a child of the devil, don't be surprised if you have trouble with your father-in-law. There are children of the devil and there are children of God. The fifth contrast is between evil and righteousness. The sixth contrast between death and life. And then the seventh one, and I want to dwell on this for a moment. There's only two people mentioned by name in these three refrains. Not as Cain, but as Christ. Now there is a great contrast here between Cain Amen. and Christ. Amen. The scripture says we are not to be like Cain, but we are to be like Christ. Amen. Cain, the Bible says, belonged to the evil one. Yeah. Uh, he was a child of Adam and Eve, but he was a child of someone else. He was a child Amen. of the devil. And he had a problem with anger. Anger. God warned him in Genesis 4 and verse 7. Sin is crouching at your door. And it desires to have you. But you must master it. Amen. We live in a world that's out of control. Cover story on two of the three Newsweekly magazines just a couple weeks ago was Road Rage. And you've heard of this. People that get so angry because somebody cuts in front of them in traffic, they, they actually stop them and get out and kill them with their bare hands. That's the kind of world we're living in today. It's a phenomenon. But it started way back. He couldn't control his anger. God warned him about it. He said, you must master it, but he didn't. Sin did devour Cain. But the tragedy is, in the process, Cain devoured someone else, his own brother. He killed Abel. He lured him into the field, that's in the Hebrew, and he slew him. Literally, he cut the throat. Noble Staten says in his commentary on 1 John that he took a holy method, the only thing he'd ever seen, and that was his brother do it because he hadn't practiced it himself, which was blood sacrifice, and used it in an unholy manner. He slit the throat of his own brother. Just as we do when we take words which have great power. The Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue and use them to speak against a brother for whom Christ died. The Bible calls that slander. And how many brethren have been slayed, slain with slander? Cain is contrasted to Christ. This is how, chapter 3, verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Now we know what hate is because of Cain, but this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Amen. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And I've said this before in our unity meetings, we will never ever be able to lay down our lives for our brothers in Christ if we cannot learn to lay down a few differences. That's what Romans 14 and 15 is all about. Amen. Jesus Christ did not take the life of a brother. He gave his life for us so that we could become brothers. In fact, as Paul says in Romans 5 verses 8 and 10, while we were still sinners, read on in the text, indeed, while we were God's enemies, Christ Amen. died for us to make us brothers, to make us one in Christ. Now, Cain was blessed with a brother, but he brutally murdered that brother because, the Bible says, his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. The Bible says, Genesis 4, 8, that Cain attacked his brother Abel, and killed him. And then God came to him and said, Where is your brother Abel? And Cain replied, I don't know. He did know. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes, Cain, you are your brother's keeper. But more than that, you were your brother's brother. Yeah. And you should have thought of that before you killed him. 
And we need to think of that before we speak against a brother in Christ. Not only are we our brother's keeper, we are our brother's brother. How many times every day and every hour and every minute does this cry come from the church grounds or the campgrounds or the conference grounds when God says your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So you have a great contrast here between Cain and Christ. Not as Cain, but as Christ. The Bible says of Christ in John 13, verse 1, having loved his own, he loved them unto the end. He did not cause the end of their life. He loved them to the end of his own life. Now, brotherly love is the proof of the passage, how I know that I have passed, how I've crossed over from a state of death, a kingdom of death, into a kingdom of light. We know that we have passed from death to life, not because we love our parents, or not because we as parents love our children, not because we as husbands love our wives, or as wives we love our husbands, not because we love the truth, not because we love preaching, but because we love our brothers. We love them because they too are a child of the Father, they too belong to Christ. They too are striving as best they can to be his servant. Carl Ketcherside used to say that fraternity is based upon paternity. Mm -hmm. And wherever God has a son or a daughter, there I have a brother or sister, and I'm under obligation to love them as I should. I am constantly impressed with the emphasis that is placed on relationships that are to exist between brethren in Scripture. And I'll not give you all the references, but I'll just give you the statements. We are to prefer one another, edify one another, receive one another, admonish one another, greet one another. That's hard for some to do. One man went to church and heard a preacher preach a sermon called, Will We Recognize One Another in Heaven? And no one shook his hand, and he told his wife on the way out, Well, we, I wonder if we'll recognize each other on earth as brothers in Christ. We are to serve one another, forbear one another, be kind to one another, submit to one another, forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you, to comfort one another, to encourage one another, to exhort one another, to consider one another, to care for one another, to be at peace with one another, and to love one another. Amen. I believe that love is the acid test of Christianity. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's the preeminent Christian virtue. It's the sign of the reality of our faith, a faith which works by love, Galatians 5, 6. It is the first fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, among other things. And I have come to believe that division reigns where the Spirit is absent. Amen. The Bible says in Jude 19, Jude 19, that the men who divide you are devoid of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's why you have division in the church, Amen. because men have not yielded to the promptings and urgings of the Holy Spirit to receive one another, accept one another, be at peace with one another, all the other one another passages that are there in Scripture. I do believe that love is the greatest of the three abiding graces. I believe that love is the most powerful emotion and the greatest force in the universe. Love sent Jesus to a distant world, to a frenzied mob, to the agony of the cross, and love held him there for six hours one Friday. The warmth of love, however, penetrated a rock-cold tomb and raised him from the dead. And love welcomed him back to heaven in the grandest celebration since the creation itself. Amen. Love transformed Simon Peter from a foul-mouthed fisherman to a broken-hearted fisher of men. Love struck down Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, changing him from a fierce persecutor of Christ to a flaming propagator of Christianity. Love touched the hardened heart of a career criminal, causing him to weep, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Love has enabled millions of Christians to be true to the faith in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. There are many truths in Scripture, but there is one truth that outshines all others, like the sun outshines the stars. 
Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Who could argue with that? But somehow we do. Somehow we manage to make miracles or healing or tongues greater in importance and magnitude than even faith or hope, both of which, all of which, are lesser than love. What fools we mortals be. I believe that 1 Corinthians 13, when understood and believed and most of all applied, would end all chapter 11 bankruptcies in the church. And I'm talking about the spiritual kind, 1 Corinthians 11, 18. I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. What an obscene scene this is. The called out calling each other out. The heirs of salvation splitting heirs in the congregation. The body of Christ dividing and subdividing and self-destruction. I believe that the solution for our ills, especially our ill wills, and sometimes our willy-nilly thinking, is found in the great love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. Paul, who was won by the light of love on the way to Damascus, shows us the most excellent way. And it will lead us to a city greater than Damascus, for without it we're on the road to doom. First consider in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, love's preeminence. He says it's greater than oratory, whether it's human or angelic oratory. It's greater than prophetic knowledge, greater than mountain-moving faith, greater than St. Francis-like philanthropy or Joan of Arc-like martyrdom, giving your body to be burned. Without love, he says, it's a spiritual gong show. And then in verses 4 through 8, he talks about love's particulars. He says, love is active. He doesn't say it, I said it. Love is active. It's sometimes proactive, but it's never reactive. For love is patient. Here's where Paul speaks, and he gives a what I call thesis of eight as he talks about eight particulars that love does. Love is patient, love is kind, it rejoices with the truth, it protects, it trusts, it hopes, it perseveres, it never fails. Mm, but love does not envy or hate or boast or manifest pride or rudeness. It is not self-seeking or easily angered and refuses to delight in even or keep record of wrongs. That is the particulars of love. And then he closes verses 8 through 13 with the permanence of love. Paul prophesies the end of prophecy. This is a strange, if you ever saw one in the Bible. He prophesies the end of prophecy. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Now, that's a prophecy most of the prophecy experts don't like to get into. But that's what he says. He prophesies that prophecy will cease. And what about tongues? He says they will be stilled. And even knowledge, as much as we love it and need it and sometimes are puffed up by it, will pass away as well. So what else is left? Only one thing. Out of all these things he mentions, he says only one remains, and it's the greatest of all, and that is love. Now, if love is the only thing that will last, let me ask a question. Why is it just about the last thing that we try? when we have problems in our marriage, or problems between brethren, or problems in the congregation. Why is it the last thing we try? Paul's thesis of eight, and I'm referring there to the eight positives of love, the particulars, never broke up a friendship, never did, never divided a church, never will, but I can guarantee you that the ugly antithesis of love which is envy and boasting and pride and rudeness and self-seeking and being easily angered and keeping record of wrongs and delighting in evil is at the rotten root of every church upheaval since the carnival, carnal atmosphere in Corinth. I guarantee you, it is. Forrest Gump said, I'm not a smart man, but I know what love is. That's better than a box of chocolates, believe me. What can save us from our strife? 
the same thing that saved us from our sins. I was saved by God's amazing love. June 22, 1958. His grace was greater than my disgrace. He gives me grace to love others as I have been loved. And my personal philosophy is that grace makes you gracious. You say, but I'm afraid where that might lead. Well, perfect love casts out fear. You say, but surely there's more than love. Paul says all the law is fulfilled in one word. Love. You say, but it might make me soft on sin. Love covers a multitude of sins. Shem and Japheth covered the nakedness of Noah and received the blessing. Ham broadcast the story of his father's failure and received the curse. I don't know about you, but as for me, I would rather have the blessing. Amen. The Welsh have a proverb. It is easy for them who have never been loved to sneer at love. Now, I personally believe that's why we have some of the animosity that we do in our church fellowships today. Because some people tragically have never ever been loved. So it's easy for them to sneer at love because they've never experienced it. They've never seen it. They've never felt it. And that's where it's incumbent upon you and me as spirit-filled Christians and the fruit of the spirit is love to manifest love so that for maybe the first time in their life they can experience love. I drive by the bus station in Joplin every night on my way home from work and you see some pretty tragic figures at bus stations. And I saw one yesterday and I wondered by the look on that woman's face as she lagged behind the man, whether it was her husband or her companion or pimp, I don't know. But there was just a set to her shoulders and a lost look in her face that made me wonder, has this poor woman ever known love in her life. Mm. And the streets are filled with them, and tragically, church pews too. Thornton Wilder, in his book, The Bridge of San Luis Rey, wrote these words. There is a land of the living and a land of the dead, and the bridge is love. Mm -hmm. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Amen. Let brotherly love continue. God bless you. Amen. Amen.